Lindsay is no stranger to our um, webinars, but she is a dynamic professional with over seven years of experience as a career coach, a resume writer, entrepreneur, a real estate investor, and experience in pharmaceutical sales at a top pharmaceutical company. She specializes in creating custom resumes, cover letters, and LinkedIn profiles. Um, additionally, she offers personalized one-on-one -on -one interview preparation to ensure that her clients are confident in pre uh, presenting themselves during interviews. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Lindsay, to kick off today's presentation. Thank you so much for the intro. Welcome, everyone. I'm really excited to have you all here today for our webinar on career planning and job search strategies. So whether you're pre-health, pre-student or career changer, this session is really designed to provide you with practical tips and insights to help you navigate the job market and land your dream role. Today, we'll explore essential strategies to help you stand out in your interviews and secure desired roles. Um, as mentioned, my name is Lindsay and I'm the owner of Limitless with Linz and the lead career coach and resume writer with six years of experience helping clients navigate the job market and craft effective resumes. So I found this quote, and I thought it was really applicable to what you all are going through. It says, success is not final, failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. And this is by Winston Churchill. And I think it's very important before we dive in to understand the mindset that you all need to have in order to embark on this journey towards your career in medicine. So one, we know that we need to embrace the journey. So pursuing a career in medicine is long and challenging path. So you're going to face numerous tests, both academically and personally. So understand that each step, whether it's a success or a step back, is going to be part of the journey, even if you get a rejection, say, from a company. So you need to learn from every experience. Successes and failures alike provide valuable lessons. So when you succeed, recognize what you did right and build on those strengths. When you face setbacks, analyze what went wrong with some self-awareness and use that knowledge to improve and grow. Resilience is also going to be key when you're applying to these jobs. Resilience means it's the ability to bounce back from these difficulties. So that's going to be cru crucial to cultivate a mindset that helps challenges as opportunities develop your skills and character. So that continuous improvement as well is going to help you along, which is really going to make sure that you are passionate and alive in the career path that you choose as well. And also just the courage to continue. I mean, there's going to be lots of ups and downs, like I mentioned. So you have to have the courage to keep going. There'll be times when you're going to feel overwhelmed. You're even going to doubt your abilities. So in these moments, you need to remember that your persistence and determination are what truly count. So keep this quote in mind to help you navigate the ups and downs of your career journey, that success is not a destination, but a continuous process. So embrace it, learn from it, and most importantly, have the courage to continue. So some of the career um, objectives we're going to cover um, are how to create a compelling LinkedIn profile and network effectively. If you were a part of our part one series, we touched on this, but I want to backtrack on it because it's going to be very important on the next steps of, you know, leveraging your career search tools and compelling, um, you know, attracting a lot of people to your profile, um, as well as preparing for interviews to stand out and job applications with star plus techniques to answering behavioral based questions asking insightful questions to hiring managers and anticipating and preparing for common interview questions. So when you are going through your LinkedIn profile, it's a really powerful tool and a honestly a professional networking for job searching. So it's really powerful and compelling and starts with that professional photo and an engaging headline. So your headline should clearly state who you are and what you want to achieve. And moving on to your about section, this is an opportunity to tell your story because your resume can't necessarily share your whole story in one document. So this is also the opportunity to highlight your skills, your experiences, your career goals. So make sure your experience and education sections are detailed and reflect your journey and achievements accurately. So one of the big parts of preparing for an interview is researching. So you want to start by researching the employer thoroughly. You want to understand their missions, their values, and culture, and review the job description in detail to identify the key skills and experiences they're looking for. This will help you align your answers with their expectations. So here's some background on LinkedIn and how we want to leverage LinkedIn to network. So networking is a key to making the most of LinkedIn. So I want you to start by connecting with professionals within your desired field. 
Look for people who are where you want to be in your career and connect with them. Engage with content by liking, commenting, and sharing posts that resonate with you. And this will actually increase your visibility. So don't forget to join LinkedIn groups related to healthcare or pre-med communities to expand your network and gain valuable insights as well. And the other key thing that a lot of people don't know is a resource on LinkedIn is the open to work. This can either put a banner on your around your photo, or you can just make it to recruiters only depending on your current job situation. So I want you to keep that in mind as well. And also make sure you send some direct message to employees and hiring managers and recruiters. The biggest thing right now, the people getting jobs are the ones that are leveraging their network. So what I want you to keep in mind is that you can message these employees and ask them for 15 minutes of time to learn more about the culture, the daily responsibilities, the job criteria. And then at the end of that call, you know, they'll say, you know, you say, can you please refer me in the system? Because the people getting jobs right now are the ones that are getting referred in the system or the guy that knows we got. So I want you to start really leveraging that and inquire about references. So here's actually a sample of a message to send on LinkedIn. You can say, I hope this message finds you well. My name is Lindsay, and I'm currently pursuing a position in the medical field at X company. I am very interested in this opportunity and eager to learn more about the company. I would greatly appreciate the chance to have a brief 15-minute discussion with you to gain insights into the company culture, the daily duties associated with the role, and key criteria for success in the position. Additionally, I would love to hear advice you might have regarding the application process and potential for referrals. Thank you in advance for your time and assistance. I look forward to the possibility of connecting with you soon. So feel free to leverage this, copy and paste it, because this is one of the biggest questions I get from clients is like, I'm a little nervous to message people on LinkedIn. I'm shy, whatever the case may be, just know there's going to be a percent of people that do want to help you. There's going to be the other percent that are not on LinkedIn or don't want to help you and that's fine, but there's going to be the percent that are like me that want to see people succeed. And when they see your amazing LinkedIn profile and all your achievements, they're going to say, I want that person on my team. So that really brings that all together as well. So some job search, LinkedIn really job search function is incredibly useful. So you can set up job alerts to get notified about a new job that might match your criteria. You can also follow companies you're interested in to stay updated on their job openings and news, which can help you in the interviews. Um, and then when engaging the, with recruiters, be professional and also be direct. Let them know why you're interested in the position, and also let them know why you're a good fit and what about your background will make you successful in the role. So let's begin by discussing why interview preparation is so crucial. No matter how confident or skilled you are, practicing is key. I can say from experience, even being a career coach, I still need to practice verbalizing my own answers. So the most nervous and least confident people are often those who did not prepare adequately. So by preparing, you ensure that you make a great impression and confidently showcase your skills and experiences. So remember, the last thing you want to do is get in the door, have a great resume, and then to blow your chances after putting all the effort to get all of your resume, LinkedIn profile, and cover letter noticed. So you want to go in prepared with key stories and answers, and that's what we're going to talk through more right now. So let's talk about the mock interviews and practice. Interview prep, no matter how, you know, how you're feeling, how nervous you are, things like that, we got to make sure that we conduct mock interviews with a mentor or a friend to stimulate the interview experience. This will help you become more comfortable with answering questions and managing interview stress. So use the feedback you receive to improve your performance as well. So remember, the more you practice, the more confident you will become. So I really want to stress the importance of trying to verbalize your answers and strategize before you walk in the door. And I know it's an uncomfortable situation and it's weird and it's awkward, but go to somebody you trust that can really make sure it's a judgment-free zone and help you identify your weaknesses and your interview skills and common questions and give you that constructive feedback you know you deserve. So we want to approach interviews as conversations, not interrogations. So think of it like meeting new people at a cocktail party. First impressions are everything. So be genuinely curious, ask questions, be animated, and start with small talk to get comfortable. Interviews are a likability game. They want to know if they can work with you or not, because after all, they're going to be working with you over 40 hours a week. So they got to know they can actually like you and trust you and that you'll be a good fit for the team. So I would always say to match the interviewer's energy. Remember to smile and just have fun with it. If you enjoy the conversations, then chances are they will too. The biggest goal is to make them forget that they're interviewing you. 
And that's what I always tell people. It's like, you don't know anything about them. They don't know anything about you. So in the beginning of that session, before you even get started, if it's a Friday interview, say, do you have any plans for the weekend? Or it's summertime, you can ask them, do you have any plans with your family for the summer? And they'll say their answer. And you, they'll say, you know, I'm traveling with my kids and my, and my wife. And they'll say, oh, how old are your kids? That sounds so fun. Where are you headed? So again, a follow-up question shows you're genuinely interested and curious about them and make it humanize yourself a little bit. And that'll help you stand out from other interviewers. So understanding and articulating your key skills is crucial for standing out in interviews. So let's go through a personal assessment to identify your three key skills that align with the job you're applying for and will make you stand out. Some of these things might sound like, what's my biggest strengths and qualifications for the position? You can look at the job posting and identify the most critical qualifications they're seeking. You can also cross-reference these qualifications with your resume to find moments or examples where you have demonstrated all these key skills effectively. And think, really, what sets me apart from other candidates? That's really what's important as well. So think about unique experiences, skills, or accomplishments that make you a strong candidate. Consider what makes you different and why the company should choose you over others. And I actually write this down even before I go into an interview. I'll write down like why me? What makes me so much better than somebody else? And you have to have that confidence. So also think about what might keep you from getting the job. Identify any potential weaknesses or gaps in your experience that could be a concern for the employer. Also, I want you to develop strategies to address these areas and how you may overcome them or why they won't or why they won't impact your performance in the role. What questions do you at least wanna make sure you'd be asked in the interview? So identify a question that makes you uncomfortable. Some of people are like, what's your greatest weakness or why should I hire you? Those questions make them so uncomfortable. So I want you to identify a couple key areas or questions that you're a little uncomfortable with. Also work out a thoughtful and honest response in advance so you can handle it confidently if it does come up. By conducting this personal assessment, you'll be better prepared to showcase your strengths and address any potential concerns, giving you that competitive edge over other interviewers. So this next part, let's really discuss what a behavioral-based question is. I feel like that's dropped a lot and people don't always understand what it is and why it's being asked. These questions are designed to assess how you've handled situations in the past, and that can help them indicate how you're gonna perform in the future. Employers usually ask these questions to understand your problem-solving skills, how you handle stress, and your ability to work in a team. Behavioral questions often start with phrases like, tell me about a time when, or give me an example of. So just keep in mind that they're looking for specific instances or stories from your past experience that demonstrate key skills relevant to the job. So preparing for these questions using the star plus format technique will help provide structure and impactful answers. And we're gonna dive into that as well. So here's some tips for answering behavioral-based questions. When it comes to answering behavioral-based questions, following a structured approach can make a significant difference. Here are some key tips to help you answer these questions effectively. So first you wanna listen carefully to the question. Pay close attention to what the interview is actually asking. Behavioral questions can be long-winded and sometimes vague. So make sure you catch all the details. Ensure you understand the question. Before you even start answering, make sure you fully understand what it is they're trying to ask you and what they're trying to understand. You can paraphrase it back to the interview to interviewer actually to even confirm. For example, you can say, so you want to know about a time when I blank? Is that correct? Organize your answer within five to eight seconds. Take some time, take a sip of water. Don't feel like you need to react and respond immediately. Take a moment to organize your thoughts and take a pause. I know it might sound like a long pause or feel like a long one, but it's not. It's actually appreciated by them. And um, the other part too, is to make sure that you state your answer concisely in under two minutes. We wanna make sure your answer is focused and to the point. Aim to conclude your response within about two minutes. And this ensures you'll provide enough detail without losing their attention. We all know people have no attention span lately. So keep that in mind. And if they wanna know more information after you've answered their question, they'll ask, they'll double click. It's like, can you expand on X? So keep that in mind. Stay on track with your planned response and avoid any temptation to add any of those extra details that won't be relevant. And that can really help you structure a really impactful response and demonstrate your suitability to the role. So what is the STAR plus technique? Now, everybody's pretty much heard STAR. Situation, task, action, result. 
And the plus is something that I like to add in there um, to help you really stand out. So you want to use the star method to structure your answers. So describe a situation, the tasks you were assigned, the actions you took, and the results you achieved. This method will help you provide clear and concise answers that highlight your capabilities. Researching the company is vital and preparing to answer behavioral-based questions using this star plus technique will help you shine. So think about the situation, you describe a specific event, then explain what, need, what you needed to do or what you needed to accomplish and the action you took and then the results, AKA share the outcomes of your efforts. And then my plus is talking about what is it that you learned? You want to reflect on your learnings and how to apply it to the new role. And always bring it back to them. Always bring it back to the company. People don't always care what you've done. They want to know how you can help them. So the biggest piece of advice I have for you is the end of it, answering any question or sharing any story. Have one line that explains why you're excited for the job and what you plan to do for them or how you're gonna leverage this experience to help you excel and make their lives easier as a manager. Let's be honest, they just wanna know you're gonna make their lives easier. So here's some examples of applying the STAR Plus format to answer behavioral-based questions. So this can either be around communication, problem solving, adaptability, but you can see in each of, each of these answers, I'm identifying, quantifying where I can. You can see it under problem solving. I talk about the result. Well, if you're going to talk about a result, you better have some numbers to back it up. So you increase donor retention by 20% and increased overall donations by 15%. So you talk about what you learned at the end and you bring it back to them and why they should care. But really, I want you to understand that the Star Plus format is just telling a story like you're at the cocktail hour. That's really what it's all about is sharing a story to get them interested and get them engaged. So I always tell people, come up with about five to 10 key stories that you can use to answer any of the behavioral-based questions or any questions they might ask you. And some of these answers can be used in different ways. Maybe your problem-solving answer can also be a moment where you collaborated or thought outside of the box. So just think about it that way and how you can kind of twist and turn these answers for different questions. So here's some questions you might be asked. One might be, tell me about yourself. Why do you want to become a blank? How do you handle stress and challenges? What are your strengths and weaknesses? Tell me about a time when you faced an ethical dilemma. Tell me about a time when you had to work and meet a tight deadline or worked under pressure. These are all things that are very applicable to people in the medical field because those are key transferable skills they're gonna be looking for. So when you answer these questions, you wanna highlight involvement in extracurricular activities, maybe volunteering, research, leadership roles, and how these experiences have shaped you personally and professionally to help you grow. You also want to prepare for some technical questions that assess your knowledge of pre-medical concepts, maybe biology, chemistry, physics, medical terminology. So practice explaining complex topics in a clear and concise manner and in a confident way. Here are some questions to ask the hiring manager. You always, at the end of the, every interview, they're going to say, do you have any questions for me? And the biggest shot to your own foot is saying no. <laughs> this shows you're uninterested, that you didn't do your research, and you don't quite care about the job. You can even come up with some on the, on the spot, or maybe on something they said. But I want you to hopefully come prepared with a couple of questions that you can ask them to show you're interested and did your research. So here's some questions you can ask the hiring manager that I will guarantee help you demonstrate um, any key skills that you might highlight. Now, the biggest thing here is they're going to give you an answer. And whatever they say, I want you to respond and say how that aligns with what you're looking for. And I want you to be true to yourself. You know, if they're talking about culture and something they say about the culture of the company aligns, be like, that really does resonate with what I'm looking for. So I'm really excited to hear that. Or what type of leader are they? You know, asking that them that type of question. And maybe they say that, you know, they're all about positivity and uplifting and building the culture of their team. That resonates with you. Let them know show that you're listening to their response and you're not just asking these questions to check a box. Feel free to screenshot this, take a picture, leverage them, use them. Um, but I really think these are key. But the number one question I want all of you to get comfortable, and I know you're not in sales, but I promise when you're in, in these interviews, you are selling yourself. So the last question you have to ask is, do you have any hesitations about my ability to do the job? The reason you ask this question is because you want them to possibly say something that you might not want to hear. And the reason you want to know about it is because you can address it before you walk out the door. I will tell you a story. I was um, interviewing for a pharmaceutical sales job 
And the one hiring manager to my right, I asked this question and she said, actually, I have no hesitations. I think you've done a great job. But the guy to my left had a big issue and, you know, a question about my ability to give 100% to a job if I have other side jobs. And I was pretty fresh out of college at that point. And I said, you know, I think it's really smart to have multiple lines of income. And I also believe that these skills are things that I can leverage in my personal, in, in my day-to-day -day job. But also I don't have kids. I don't watch Netflix. I'm a busybody. So I can basically run these businesses after five o'clock or on the weekends in my free time. And I won't just give you 100% of my time and energy. I'm going to give you 110% of my time and energy. So just give me the opportunity to prove it to you. Had I not asked that question and addressed it, he would have convinced that hiring manager not to hire me. And I wouldn't be as happy as I was in my career six years later working for that company. And it's all because I got ahead of it. And I was not scared to ask that question. And any client I've ever coached that to has honestly said it's been very hard to ask, but it's been the most rewarding question to ask all at the same time. And it also lets you know where you stand. Like I knew that that girl on the right liked me. It's like, okay, sold her. We're good. Let's move on to the bad cop. Let's see what he has to say. So I hope that helps there, but make sure you ask questions at the end. This is critical here. Um, documents you want to bring to the interview. Everybody always knows you want to bring your resume, right? But here are some documents. You want to bring a SWOT analysis. So that shows the strengths, the weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of maybe the business, the hospital, the company, okay? And that shows you did your research. You can talk to people that work at the company. You can use Glassdoor. You can use their website. You can use their social media. Look at other competitor websites. Find some gaps. This doesn't have to be anything labor intensive and take too long. It just has to show that, hey, I did my research. The 30, 60, 90 day plan. This shows and illustrates, hey, in the first 36, 30 days, here's what I'm gonna do. In the first 60 days, here's my plan. In the first 90 days, here's what I'm going to achieve. It can just be a couple bullet points under V. Again, don't take long on these documents, but it just shows that you are going to execute because people want people that execute and shows you did your research and create a plan. Um, this is really going to impress them. And I guarantee you, no one will bring that to the interview. You can also leverage them when you ask questions at the end of the interview, and you can ask them a question that'll gear them to say something like this, like, hey, you know, in the first 90 days, what's expected of me? And they'll give their answer and you say, I'm, you know, I'm happy that you mentioned that. I'll send over my 30, 60, 90 day plan that I created that actually aligns very well with, with your response. Or the SWOT analysis, you can do the same thing. What are some challenges that this company or this hospital is facing? And they'll say it. And then you say, I'm very, very interesting. You mentioned that I have a SWOT analysis. I'll send over my follow-up email for your review that aligns a lot with what you're saying. Third document, and so important, is the letter of recommendation. In that same exact interview I just told you about, I leverage a letter of recommendation to disarm that bad cop. That, that one really tough interview, I actually leveraged it. I was like, listen, I can say what I want all day about my work ethic and what I know I can do for you, but here's what my current employer has to say. He took a few a minute to read it or 30 seconds to read it. And he was like, okay. And he was a lot nicer the rest of the interview. He really, it disarmed him. So this is going to highlight your skills, your achievements, your character. So make sure you have like one to two, three max letter recommendations that you can use and send in this follow-up email and also leverage throughout the interview. So as far as the interview prep goes, and this is like my big guide of what to do if you're in a bind and in really big key skills here. One, research the company, which we talked about. It's the background, the mission, the values, the products, the service, the current challenges. Also review the job description. A lot of people miss this. There's some, so many buzzwords throughout a job description that you need to identify. And usually they're right under the space that says qualifications required. <laughs> so you need to base the questions you think they're going to ask around those transferable skills and make sure you come up with examples that show time management skills or critical thinking skills or medical professionalism, whatever it may be that they're dropping. I want you to really identify those key areas and points and propel those, you know, prepare those compelling responses. Um, be attentive and engaged. People like people that are engaged and are listening and are thoughtful. So make sure you don't interrupt, demonstrate interest in the company and the role and just take a deep breath because they've been in your shoes too. They have been in your shoes. They've, they've gotten to where they are today because they started at the bottom or at that position that you're looking for. Middle tier, bottom tier, top, does not matter. Do not let them intimidate you. They're just people. <laughs> so always make sure also to ask insightful questions and then follow up promptly. I think this is a big one. Um, you always want to follow up 
um, within, honestly, people say 24 hours, but like, why not send it immediately? Okay. Um, so that's something that I always emphasize and you can send the SWOT analysis, 306090 plan, letter of recs, anything you want in that follow-up email, but really emphasize what it is that you talked about, what resonated with you and your gratitude. And also make sure you dress professionally, even if it's on Zoom. Like I'm dressed professionally today. I'm dressing the part, makeup on, ready to go. Even though I'm not in person, I'm acting as if I am. And that helps my confidence. So that also will help them respect you as well. So if you're in person, come dress to the nines. You know, wear your best outfit because it makes you feel good. Look good, feel good, be good. That whole motto. Maintain a great posture. I guarantee you if I was slouching right now, my, my voice would not escalate. It would not project. It wouldn't be confident. So keep your shoulders back, stand up straight and command the room. Command your side of the table, okay? That shows confidence and always show up early. Um, always be 10 to 15 minutes early. Make time for parking. Don't take a front row parking. Don't take handicap parking. Tuck in the back. People are watching even when you think they're not. Um, check in and prepare yourself mentally. I love listening to podcasts. I also love listening or reading to books that are going to mentally prepare me. I work out in the morning before I have any big presentation or interview. And that way they can say, oh, how's your day so far? I'm like, great. I just actually went for an awesome workout. And they might resonate with that. Okay. And also get your energy up. So show your enthusiasm, show a professional, and this will definitely increase your chances of getting the job. So that, that said, some key takeaways are your LinkedIn profile, networking strategies, job search techniques, interview prep etiquette, um, all to help you with your job search. So if you want to connect with me, you want to learn more, you want help with your resume, your cover letter, LinkedIn, interview prep one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom with me, you can scan the QR code in the top right here, and that'll give you all my contact information. But right now, I just want to thank you so much for your attendance. I want to encourage you to implement the strategies that we discussed. And right now, I will say that this is a judgment-free zone, and we can leave some time for any questions that you might have. I'm an open book. Feel free to ask any or maybe even any questions that have come up or tough interview questions and how to answer them, any strategies that you guys might want to run through. This is our time. So I'll let you take it away. Thanks so much, Lindsay, for the wealth of information you shared. I'll give folks some time to add some questions in the chat or q and I don't see any yet, but I will kick off um, the questions with this. Um, a lot of times we hear when it comes time to talk about your weaknesses, what is an appropriate answer to that? And I'll, I'll give some context. I was in an interview with a candidate for a job for a healthcare company and the person was asked this question and the answer was, well, I'm a perfectionist and I like to do things the right way the first time and that could hinder, you know, collaboration with the team and he ended up not getting the job. I don't know if it was how he expressed um, his weaknesses or just selecting that specific one. So in your experience, what is an appropriate way to talk about your weaknesses? I think the number one, it's always about your delivery. And that's why it's so important to practice. So one of the biggest key examples here, key highlights I want to recognize is you do not want your weakness to be something that's a job requirement. So maybe mine's time management, which it is. But if the, if the role job requirement or anywhere on that job posting says something about time management skills, I'm not going to use that weakness. Now, the other thing is making sure that whatever weakness you choose, you kind of turn it by saying what you're doing to improve upon it. That is the biggest thing. Like it can still be a weakness of mine. Maybe public speaking is something I don't enjoy as much, but what am I doing to work on it? What type of uncomfortable positions am I putting myself in to show that every day I'm getting better? The second thing I want people to keep in mind is that your weaknesses are usually innate. Something you're born with. I would even use the joke in the interview that like, it's not my fault. I was born with it. Blame my dad because he's a lot like that too. Directionally challenged, not my fault. He's like that as well. So those are the types of things that you need to recognize. And you can even say that in the interview, like this is something that I was not born naturally very great at, but here's what I'm doing to improve upon it. Or maybe it's Excel. It could be something like that. Um, so just keep that in mind. Being a perfectionist is the reason that wasn't a good answer is because everybody says it. I work too hard. I'm a perfectionist. Like it's so generic. Like you need something that is so unique. Like for me, I make really difficult things very easy, but very easy things are very difficult for me. So for example, like I wouldn't say this in the interview, but like I can make risotto, but rice is difficult. 
that's really backwards. <laughs> that's not normal. So keep it real, really reflect on some of your weaknesses. You can even take personality tests to understand what are your weaknesses and um, make it twist it in that way. But I think that that's probably why that answer wasn't the greatest. So try to be outside of the box. That'd be my, my number one key takeaway for that as well. But great question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I see a few questions coming in and one asks from um, the perspective of someone who isn't always comfortable making connections with other people, do you have any advice on how to get better with this? Yeah. The first thing to do, and I, and I know not everybody's a raging extrovert personality and that makes so many people uncomfortable. So no, you're not alone. But the first thing to do is just take that first step and send. Like it, the more you do it, the more comfortable you're going to be. So you have the template now to reach out to people. I use it and, and honestly, don't put all your eggs in one basket, send it to a lot of people, connect with a lot of people. And I want you to realize that that's what LinkedIn is for. It's to help you. It's, it's a networking site. So people are expecting you to reach out. They're anticipating it and they want to help you. There's the percent that doesn't, but there's the percent like me that will. And I refer people all the time into Lily. The other thing I want you to keep in mind is that a lot of these companies offer referral site, referral checks. So say, for example, um, I think GSK is an example. They, I, I work for GSK. Say, for example, I do. I refer in a client that wants to work for GSK. They get the job. I get, I get money <laughs> as an employee for referring them in the system. So a lot of people have incentives to want to refer you for that exact reason. They actually will get incentivized. So keep that in mind, but put yourself out there. I know it's uncomfortable, but once you start, it's the easiest thing. Even like my social media, that was very hard for me to post my first video and talk and get scrutinized for whatever in the comments. But once I started doing it, I was like, I got so much more confident in it. So my biggest piece of advice in anything is just to start, just do it once, see how it feels, and then continue to do it and put yourself in uncomfortable situations. And once you realize the results and how much it's helping you, you're going to be like, I'm going to continue to do this. I don't want to stop. I'm getting jobs. I'm getting interviews from this. So you'll see the outcome and the results and, and, and push yourself for sure. Thank you. Um, another question asks, um, I was told it is not required for pre-med students to create a LinkedIn profile. Does that only apply to pre-health students who are not going to medical school? Here's the thing. Things aren't always required. Cover letters aren't always required. LinkedIn's not always required. But if you put in the effort to create these things, it can help you. I'm going to tell you why. LinkedIn's a way for them to put a face to your name. It's a way to get them to feel like they already know you. It's a way to connect with hiring managers, connect with recruiters, connect with current employees that work at that hospital or company, okay? So they may not say it's required because they don't want to push people to feel like they need to use it. But I guarantee you, if you do, you will get a job over somebody else. You will stand out. We can hyperlink it on your resume because we can't put a face, you know, your face on your resume. That's not good. We have to leverage something else to put your face out there and get them to trust you. People put a face to the name and by the time you get the interview, they feel like they already know you only because you add them on LinkedIn, they saw your face there. So yes, might not be required, totally up to you either way, but I would highly recommend throwing everything you can into getting a job, whether that's a cover letter, a LinkedIn, making sure your resume looks good, interview prep, just everything you can so you don't blow your chances. Um, so I can see how it can help you in the long run, even if it's not required. Thank you. Um, another question asks, have there, has there been a challenging interviewer that you've encountered that just seemed like they were sizing you up or being rude? And what advice would you give when an interview seems like a losing battle to begin with? Is it wise to just address the circumstance and walk out? I would address it in a very professional way. Okay. Just because somebody's not treating you with respect doesn't mean you need to give them that same level of respect back or same treatment back. So I'd always take the high road. Now, if they're not engaging with you and you feel like they're just doing the interview just to check the box, no, it's nothing personal. They probably already have somebody internal in mind. They're doing this to check the box because HR is legally making them do it. <laughs> so just know some of these interviewers don't want to be there either. They don't want to be doing this. This is maybe their 50th interview for that one position. So they're a little burnout. So just understand it's not you, it's them or maybe someone they talked to before you. But I would try to make light in, of the situation, get them get them talking, make them forget it's an interview, make, you know, make it, make it fun. Um, and that's how they're going to maybe disarm you. Now, if they're coming at you in an aggressive way, like I said, I had a good cop, bad cop situation. Sometimes that does happen. That's kind of their role in the interview is to get you and, and make you uncomfortable and see how you react. 
They want to make you crack. They want to make you uncomfortable to see how you'd be in another setting. Okay. So know that that's all they're doing. It's nothing personal in any sense. Even if I walk into an office and a front, the, the gatekeeper front staff isn't very nice to me. I know it's nothing I did. It's because a rep was in there before and made her made her mad, okay? Annoyed her, upset her, whatever it was. Or maybe she's having a rough day and they're inundated, okay? So just use your emotional intelligence, okay? Address the situation. Don't take it personally, but also know that you can still put your best foot forward because who knows, they might need you down the line. Um, but also I'd kind of see that as a red flag. If someone's like really rude in an interview, I'd be like, I don't really want to be part of this culture. I don't want you as a manager. I think this is a huge part. It's kind of like dating. So you go into a date and you don't know the person and they say, you say, wow, all you're thinking about the whole time is, do they like me? Do they like me? Right. That's our insecurities coming up. But the real question is, do I like them? <laughs> okay. It's no different when you're in an interview and you're in a business setting, stop asking yourself, do they like me? Why are they mean to me? Don't worry about it. Be like, do I even like them? Do I like their attitude towards me? And the, the tides will turn <laughs> in your favor to say like, Hey, listen, you need me. I don't need you type of attitude. And that confident attitude is going to be really great for you as well. But just know that it goes both ways. You got to like them too, because you don't want some manager that that won't value, that won't value the culture and, and, and help you be promoted and, and put you in good position. So interview them just as much as they're interviewing you. Take note of that when they treat you poorly. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, another question here asks, how can I determine and describe what my personal brand is? Mm -hmm. So the way to describe your personal brand is by using the about section in the LinkedIn. And then when you're in the interview, the best way to go about this personal brand is to address it right immediate, immediately. So when they ask you, tell me about yourself, really think about what it is about your brand and what makes you, you. Everybody's unique. Everybody brings something different to the table. So that tell me about yourself question is your chance to bring that through. So I always focus on like three big things. So even in corporate for myself, one of the things I'm best known for is my ability to collaborate and partner. And, and teamwork. I love that. I thrive in that. Give me a partner. I can, I can leverage it. I really do enjoy it. Okay. That's part of my brand. Um, even my brand on social media, right? Obviously I'm so passionate about helping people in the career space. I build a whole brand around this. People know who to call when they need interview help. They need a resume. They know who to call, especially during COVID when everyone got laid off. Had I not branded myself appropriately, people wouldn't have known who to call. This is not a social media lesson. It's just a branding lesson, which applies everywhere and can help in your job. So if you want to build a brand, make sure people know exactly what it is you can do to help them when you're in the door as well. And that'll help build your brand. What can they go to for your help? What expertise do you have that's above anybody else's? And dive really deep into it and share your expertise. Don't gatekeep it. How you how you get a brand is to, to share. So you can highlight those experiences throughout your answers um, when they ask you questions and be like how I've really, you know, what, what I'm best known for is something you can say. I also use that in cover letters when I write them. I'm like, what I'm best known for is blank. And that way people know immediately how you can help them and what you're known for. Awesome. Thank you. Another question here is, how do you come back from blanking on a question or how do you respond when you really don't have an answer to a question? Okay. That's, that comes up a lot. So when you're not too sure, I want you to take a pause, take a sip of water. Take a second to gather your thoughts if you think it's going to come to you, right? Now, if you're on Zoom, here's a good trick. You can say, my internet broke up. Can you repeat that question? That buys you some time. Now, if you really don't know, I do not want you to sit there and try to BS the answer. Let's put it blank. Like, okay. I want you to be honest with them. And if it's something that you have no idea about, you can say, you know, I've never experienced that or haven't ran into that situation yet, but here's how I would handle it. Or you can say some similar situation that had maybe an outcome they're looking for. But if it's a key skill or like a te technical skill you do not have, the biggest piece of advice I can give you is to showcase that you're trainable and coachable. I always say, you know, if I can do anything on that piece of paper, my resume says I can do anything you train me to do. I'm like a dog. <laughs> train me and I'll do it. Okay. So they need to know that you're coachable and trainable and you're honestly have that self-awareness to know, I don't know everything and that's okay. I'm not supposed to, that's your job. You're the hire, you're the manager. You're the, you know, you have to know everything. I don't necessarily. So being self-aware, I think says a lot about your character versus trying to scramble for an answer that you don't really know the answer to. And you can also be like, you know, do you mind if we come back to that at the end of the, end of the interview? Um, so I can think on that a little bit and I'll say, okay. 
you know, that's okay too. But if you really don't know, please don't try to squirm your way around it. Just be honest. Thank you. And what are your thoughts around career mapping? Um, I think one of the advice I received earlier in my career is a lot of times we have a sense of where we want to go. For example, I want to be a CEO of a healthcare company, or I want to be a pediatrician, but you don't know all the steps and all the job roles that you need to acquire to get there. And it just takes a matter of, you know, putting things down on paper, if that's actually creating the visual map of how to get to where you want to get to. So what are your tips around really creating a career map, if you will, or outlining what skills or professional experience you need to get to your end goal? The biggest thing you can do is put a timeline on it. So if I have a lot of goals for this year and I was like, I need this by this time and I need to put a benchmark on it because then you'll actually get down to it. And then when it comes to the details on how to do it, get a mentor. If you want to become a pediatrician, understand, ask people that are pediatricians and how did they get there? Have as many people that are where you want to be in your corner and ask them. Have all those people around you. You want people above you and, and ahead of you to help you with this career map and really think, okay, who do I need to connect with? Do I need to go back to school? What type of certifications do I need? And line it out and, and really do your research as to what that looks like. And that'll help you get there. I have not been promoted at companies because I said I want to be promoted. I put mentors in place. I made sure my managers knew exactly what my impact was from day one. If I want an award at the end of the year or I want a promotion, I don't just show up at the end of the year saying I want an award. I make it very known in the beginning to as many people as possible that matter that these are my goals. This is what I want. So to the people that can help you get there, make sure they know your goals and people want to help you and they want to help see, they want to help you succeed. So maybe they'll give you an internship or they'll give you a job there. Okay. So get as many people in your corner as possible to help you build that career map and help you get where you want to go. And I also think it's very important to really self-reflect. Are you trying to be a pediatrician because your mom's a pediatrician or your dad is, or because you were told you need to, I mean, I, I all day long, I could be like, oh yeah, I could be the manager at this pharmaceutical company, but is that really what I want? So I want you to really take time to reflect on what it is that you actually want and build it from there. If you can envision yourself and manifest it, right, that word, really build what it is you want your future to look like, what does that look like? And sit on it. And that takes silence, that takes time alone, that takes a lot of self-reflection to understand what that looks like. And then once you build that path, like it can pivot, it can change, and that's okay too. So just keep that in mind, a career map is not set in stone, it can be pivoted, it can change, and things pop up all the time. And you might say, oh my God, being a surgeon sounds great too. Let me go learn that direction. So never pigeonhole yourself. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, but have that clear set goal and how to get there and line that up with education criteria and mentors. Awesome. Thanks so much. I don't see any other questions in the chat. So if there are no questions, we can go ahead and close out. Thank you so much again, Lindsay, for all the wealth of information that you've shared please feel free to scan the QR code on your screen to get in touch with her. If you have any questions around resume writing, interviewing preparedness, or just career planning generally, she has been a wealth of resource. I know I've used her services so I can vouch for it that she's really amazing. And for everyone who's on the call, we are excited and happy to offer $400 off any of our certification programs using code webinar 400. And I will put that in the chat as well for everyone to use. And if there are no additional questions at this time, we will go ahead and close out for today. Wishing you all a great Friday and a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank you.